some background statistics like within the European Union, and this is without Turkey, um, I mean, having, um, okay, without Croatia and Turkey that will be, uh, I mean, the, who are now candidate countries and will, will become members in the future, but as of last year, um, there is an estimated 16 million international families in the EU. And that means, yeah, citizens of different uh, EU countries, but it could be also that one, one uh, family uh, um, partner is uh, from an EU country and, and the other one for a third country national. And so what does it mean for a family to have an international dimension in the family's life? Movements probably have two languages at least and, and probably even more because um, you may have met in a third country and you're perhaps using that language. And it could be very interesting and enriching originally, right? And, and also maybe throughout the whole life uh, of the family that you have uh, cu cultural diversity and you learn from each other and probably in this group also you are learning that there are different styles and different traditions and different ways of communicating, different ways the young people do things in different countries. Everything is fine until there is a conflict. And of course, international families, just as any other regular domestic national um, uh, homogeneous family, are also, of course, affected by conflicts. Conflicts happen. Have you had any class yet on conflict theory? Yes. So, are conflicts something that we can avoid? Probably a very general answer is no. I mean, conflicts are part of life. We can deal with conflicts in different ways and try to do it constructively, try to, you know, do it uh, in a positive management way. But uh, conflicts are part of life. and. Uh, and also, just as any family um, and, and uh, family members are affected by conflicts, international families also, when they are affected by a very uh, intense conflict and decide, say, adults, parents of children decide to separate or to divorce, very often one of the parents decides to go to his or her home country. And, uh, and then the question is, can parents agree on what will happen? How will the future relationship between the children will, will take place? So you will see when hearing about international family mediation, you will very often meet uh, a term child abduction. You, do you know what that means, child abduction? Mm -hmm. So who do you think abducts children? Parent, yeah, because sometimes we could have a misperception that abductors are strangers, but in majority of cases worldwide, and worldwide there are about 100,000 um, children abducted e each year, uh, majority of these abductions are carried out by one parent, and even more so, very often um, by the parent who has a primary care, uh, who has a, a custody, but is taking a child away unilaterally without consulting and getting consent of the other parent, taking to another country. And for children this means that they risk losing contact with the other parent for a long time and maybe forever and the, parent, and the child can become sort of semi-orphan. And the question is how can we, um, what, can, what can be done in this situation? So again, in international family mediation context, you will encounter one of, for lawyers, I mean, and, but it's also good to know for non-lawyers, that there is the in, one of the main um, conventions that uh, deals with these situations is the 1980 Hague Convention on Child Abduction. But not all countries are parties to this convention. Uh, I think in 2012 there were 87 countries that were states that were party to this con convention. But it, this convention 
um, sets the objective that um, to protect children from the harmful effects of wrongful re uh, removal. So if the child has been wrongfully, illegally um, taken to another country, uh, how can we protect? Uh, the courts are asked, the courts have to look at these cases then and to ensure prompt return of the child. So that's the principle that the child should return as soon as possible uh, to the country of their habitual residence, the country where the child was integrated and lived before. And also, to, this convention seeks to secure protection of rights of access, how the other parent can have contact, how both parents can have proper contact with children. There are other international instruments, and I will not go into great detail, but there are European Custody Convention, and there are many countries that have bilateral agreements, because of course if you have one, uh, uh, countries that are not party to the Hague Convention, it's important to know what procedure will they follow in, in these kinds of cases, where one parent seeks courts uh, help and assistance in uh, getting access to the child that was uh, wrongfully uh, removed. But so you know uh, that the Hague Convention are, is the most, uh, uh, one of the central uh, legal instruments. In the European Union, uh, the legal framework that uh, is for the context of family mediation is both the Hague Convention that I just talked about and the so-called Brussels II bis regulation. Yeah? Lawyers, again, probably have heard, but it's also good for, for, for non-lawyers also to know. Uh, that regulation sets uh, rules how courts, on court jurisdiction, on enforcement of judgments in, of different uh, country courts, and uh, the context of this regulation is the parental responsibility. It talks, it's, it's like a family uh, regulation, family matters regulation. Then it's also imp good to know that uh, in the EU, uh, in the parliament in Brussels, there is a special person, by the way, Italian by origin right now, um, mediator on international child abduction. Her name is Roberta Angelilli, and she is, um, she's, uh, I think she took uh, that position in 2011, I believe, or 10, um, and, and will be there for, for, for some years. But uh, that is also um, a very act, she takes very active role in uh, promoting mediation as alternative to um, court proceedings in, in family uh, matters. And then you probably have heard already that there is an EU so-called mediation directive that is, um, uh, deals with the cross-border civil and commercial cases and civil, so for the family, uh, family matters that's important and uh, it gives judges a right to invite parties, even if the parties are in the, uh, in the court proceedings, so uh, the judge has the right to invite parties to try mediation. And the European Code of Conduct for mediators is something that most uh, European uh, mediators um, sign up to, which gives uh, an idea, uh, sets the principles and the rules. So how can mediation help? Because going to court, as you have probably heard, how does uh, going to a court and not sitting at the negotiation table, how does that affect relationship in general? What? Negatively. Yeah, and how? Negatively how? What happens when you? Stress. Stress going to court. Deeper in the conflict. You go, get deeper in the conflict. Um, court proceedings are usually, it's competition, right? Who will win? It's adversarial. You have to prove that you are better and the other one is worse. Imagine this in the situation of family. Parents are competing, you know? You are bad, I am good. And, and child be, being in the middle. Um, so mediation is an opportunity in this sense, of course, to 
sit at the table and try to agree on mutually acceptable solutions. And the mediator's role, and here are some of the principles, what you probably remember from a lecture uh, on mediation principles, that mediator is a neutral and impartial. So what does it mean to be impartial? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a personal interest in this matter in terms of that I am not interested in any result, which way it will go. What else means to be impartial and objective and no neutral? Not, 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 no I don't support. In a way, by active listening and asking questions and clarifying and helping to reframe maybe some of the issues, I can, as a mediator, provide a lot of support, in fact. However, it's not a support in the sense that it's not advice or it's not like I become a friend, right? So there is a border of that. But people in mediation parties feel supported. That they very often after giving feedback to mediator, they would say, I felt supported, that that, that was important, that I felt supported and understood. But it's the same, but it's not, I don't take sides, yeah? I don't. Uh, support one and unsupport the other. I give equal treatment and equal opportunity to both um, parties to explain, to express, to speak. And you probably by now have heard that mediators work, sometimes we work in um, so-called joint sessions where we are all at the same, in the same room at the same time. But sometimes also we use private sessions where we sp speak to each, sometimes they're called caucuses, yeah, in different li literature, caucuses, private sessions, private meetings, same term. The idea is that we speak to each party separately and, and, uh, and try to see maybe there is something more to that story or maybe this party is very quiet. I want to understand what's going on. Uh, why, why, why are you not expressing your needs? Why are you not expressing your um, concerns? So these are things that we do in private. And um, the fact that mediation is co um, confidential and voluntary. So what does voluntariness mean? How do you understand? That both parties agree to mediate, that they say, okay, we will try. Yeah, what else? They decide to go with an IDR personally and without the violence or the threat mm -hmm. That it's not a, um, it's not a, an obligation in a way, yeah, that they, they're not forced to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. They can be, they can meet, they, they can be flexible in, in that sense. They can leave, they can yeah. That's very important, yeah, to understand that sometimes, uh, speaking about getting to mediation, some countries have regulations where in cer certain cases, a court can even order and say, you have to try mediation. And of course, parties want to look good in the, ju in the eyes of the judges, and, uh, and that's all understandable and maybe even, you know, they, they have the obligation to prove that, okay, bring back a document that we were at mediation. Um, but exactly at the moment when, when the parties start mediation, that voluntariness or the principle of voluntariness is very, very important and mediators remind because whenever parties feel um, that they, they are stuck, maybe there is a, and there is a, impasse and they cannot get further and we as mediators always ask, well, what do you want to do? What will happen if you don't agree here? So what are your alternatives? And they know they, they don't have to stay here, but the question is what will they do if they leave mediation and uh, who will decide for them and what will be that decision? Is it known? This is in your hands, this is your chance. Yeah? So it gives motivation and, and responsibility again to parties. So voluntariness is very, very, uh, psychologically important principle that, that uh, people understand that it's not like, well, I can leave any time, so I'm not, I don't have to work. It's actually a lot of pressure you have to do yourself. You have to take that chance yourself to decide on your life. Of course, um, 
taking into consideration the other party's needs and wishes as well. And so issues in family mediation that can be discussed, I mean, here are some of the lists. It's about return of the child, if the child has been, um, or if one parent is considering leaving and the other one parent is not um, agreeing um, yet, uh, then uh, again, in mediation, this can be discussed. What, ab what about future living arrangements? How will this, where will child live? Um, on custody, on visitation of the other parent, contact, holidays and birthdays, very important. Uh, religious and cultural and language, bilingual upbringing, yeah? Child support, financial arrangements between parents, also sometimes property issues, but division of assets, but uh, that could be also um, sometimes difficult, perhaps to discuss all in, in one go, uh, in the context of a child, but it can be touched upon or sometimes even settled. But separation and divorce, if couple has just separated, but what will happen if we want to get divorced? Which court, where will we um, apply? Can we agree on that? And um, also during the mediation, if one parent has not seen the child for, for a longer time because the other parent has abducted the child, then during mediation we can discuss about contact, how maybe during these mediation days there can be contact arranged with a parent who hasn't seen the child for, for a while. And uh, anyone can initiate a mediation. It can be parties themselves, their lawyers, it can be um, a judge. Central authority, it's in each country is a term that derives from the um, Hague Convention and uh, usually it's Ministry of Justice but not necessarily. In some countries it's, it's, it's different and they are sort of the coordinating body where uh, that gives also information and, and support to the parent who um, files, uh, files the proceedings or initiates proceedings. And um, what characterizes child abduction cases and family mediation that there is a time consuming preparation because usually there is a distance and of course with technology to some extent that can be overcome now uh, with Skype talks or video conferences for preparation. However, not every um, parent and, and not in every country, in every city, in every village, there is all that infrastructure in place and that possibility and the time difference can be of, a, 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 of issue, especially if it's like across um, um, continents uh, case. So that is something that has to be taken into account. And um, if it happens and there is agreement to try mediation on one specific location, one specific um, city, then, uh, then travel arrangements are made and then of course that time has to be made as efficient as possible and used so it's usually about two to three days of very intensive mediation sessions that take place and uh, the background of it is that of course it's very highly escalated usually parents are uh, with high emotions they don't trust each other the fear of losing child, both parents, the one who hasn't seen for a while, but also the one who has abducted and maybe has a child right now, fears that he or she may lose the child if, if there are other decisions made. Um, they, they feel very angry, betrayed, and uh, insecure. What is the preferable model for working as mediators uh, in family cases, in international family cases, is co-mediation. Have you heard that term? Yeah? Mediators very often work in pairs. Uh, and in, in these international family mediation cases, it's even more important that these could be mediators from both cultures, um, representing both genders, if possible, uh, that it could be both languages, if that is a factor, if there is not one common language, for example, 
And also, sometimes by background, by professional background, that there could be a legal and, and say, psychosocial background, the combination. Just like in outside family cases, there could be co-mediation, for example, in medical um, disputes. Important that there is perhaps one mediator is a lawyer and the other one is a medical um, specialist, if that is important. Or in construction disputes, that there is an engineer, for example, and a lawyer. Or, but in family cases, very often it's, it's um, found to be very efficient that there is a lawyer, even though mediators don't give advice, it's good to know the, the legal framework. And uh, psychosocial, psychologist, or social worker, or psychotherapist, or, or educator, like a teacher background. And the uh, preferable model is to focus on, uh, on the child. So we understand parents are in conflict. And of course, child will be well if parents will be well. We understand that. But to try to bring that perspective to the parents that it's, in, it's the interest of the child that they have to think about and focus on is something we um, work on. And, um, we also aim at facilitating contact to absent parent, separate sessions I already mentioned. And we work with people to see if there are all possible scenarios. What will happen if the child goes back to the country where it was removed from? And, and what would happen in that case? What would happen if the, the, child, if the parents made agreement that the child can stay in this country where, where the child is now? I mean, all that can be discussed and uh, developed and discussed pros and cons. So stages of mediation, and you will have one role play later, but uh, it's basically the preparation stage, the phone calls, um, arrangements, travel, agreement. And once the parties are here, we again remind them of uh, mediation principles. And we sign agreement to mediate, which explains, again, mediator's role, their rights, um, voluntariness, confidentiality, etc. Then the second phase or stage of mediation is defining the issues. So what concrete questions are at stake in this situation and what can be um, discussed in this short, say, two or three day uh, mediation time frame, what's realistically. Because if we want to talk about all the 20 years of marriage, might not be enough time. But we have to focus on what specific issues. And um, there is always at some point exploring the conflict stage, emotions, what happened, how this all came about and, and, and what, how has it affected, how the conflict has affected everybody. But hopefully after that stage, there is a possibility to look at the generating new uh, options, exploring what scenarios and, and, and possibilities there are to solve. And if the parents agree, then finalizing the agreement. So the question when to mediate, mediation is appropriate in, in any phase of the um, conflict. Uh, it can be before it even there is a case uh, filed for the court. Uh, but of course, if it doesn't, doesn't happen, it can be also when a case is in the court and it's pending. It can be also between the first hearing and the decision. It can be after the first decision is taken and the appeal. And even if there is a decision and uh, there is a discussion on how to implement, how to enforce that decision, how to actually make it happen. Because the uh, court will just say, you have to return the child by that date, for example. Mediation can be useful to discuss how will this happen, who will pay, who will meet, who will accompany the child, etc. all the details that can be very important. And lawyers um, can be very helpful, those who want to be lawyers, and I understand some half, half of the group are with legal background, but if you 
Lawyers can support their clients in mediation. Lawyers who know what mediation is is, is very valuable uh, skill because um, they understand that it's more about the personal needs and less about the positions and less about the legal arguments. Um, they can always give advice at the stage of solutions to sort of uh, evaluate different uh, re uh, solutions and, and possibilities. And they can help to finalize agreement to make it into a legal document so that it becomes binding in both jurisdictions. We talk about that both parents having um, different jurisdictions. But there are, of course, also limits. Mediation might not be suitable for all cases, even if we want to always advise and, and, and use and make use. Mediation, uh, if, um, if there is a fear of violence, for example, domestic violence or child abuse, those cases might not be suitable for mediation. Then court order might be the appropriate. Also, if parties are not motivated to solve, uh, we meet a lot of people who, want, who do not want to take responsibility for their own decisions. They want, they, they, they want the court, they want authority to take the decision for them. And, uh, and if that is the case, or if there are uh, sometimes um, extended families, um, parents of, uh, of parents, uh, grandparents, play a very important role in advising and saying you should do this, you should not, you should not agree to this, you should. So then if there is a lack of motivation for decision also, the mediation is not possible. And um, psychological aspect in mediation. During um, Relationships break down. Cultural differences, some parents very often experience as a threat. They suddenly um, start to feel that it's not a positive but a negative factor that they have to count. And it's very natural that both parents want to be active in their child's life. How is that possible? How will we make it work? Uh, one parent might feel trapped and wishes to return to the country after divorce. Trapped in the country where they have been living for the last few years. Uh, about the emotions we, I mentioned earlier, reaction, reaction of the left behind parent. There is a danger of reabduction because uh, parents might feel um, feelings of revenge, of um, powerlessness, and uh, so there is always a risk of reabduction and that both parents are afraid of losing their children. And children are caught in the middle. And the psychological impact, I took this from um, an NGO in Belgium, Child Focus, and they are based in um, Brussels. They, um, they have published a, a study and uh, also a prevention guide, and they say, well, for children, of course, they, the fact that they are denied contact with the left behind parent and uh, with the, their familiar environment, everything that was their life, their home, their toys, their friends, their schoolmates, their, their uh, environment, neighbors, um, are suddenly all gone. And uh, of course, for children, it's emotionally very important to have a relationship with both parents. And children say also after you know, growing up and looking back at, at uh, years where they lacked that contact or it was, yeah, they were deprived of that contact. Um, they say that um, their feelings, they, it didn't change with divorce. I mean, they still loved the parents, both parents. So that is something that, um, that has to be kept in mind. Uh, children's reactions can be manifested as an aggressive behavior, withdrawal, difficulty to, um, uh, express affection, uh, they don't trust when they grow up. And it's very long-term consequences from childhood that the children have. 
But for parents, uh, they say, and this is taken from a qualitative study and interviews with parents, that they say that uh, it was very difficult even when they were made, uh, that when the contact was agreed upon, and if it is very long distance contact and you cannot see the children regularly and so, that it's very difficult communication. It's uh, lots of obstacles. Sometimes the other parent uh, interferes uh, when, uh, when one parent wants to speak with the child on the telephone. Children sometimes are too young to talk on the phone, to, to express, to say something. Also, what, are, what is the message as a, as a parent? What do you say? What happened? Why are you not here? How do you explain all that? So it's very dramatic changes that, are, that affect uh, both parents, not only the one do, that lost the contact or, or, or lacks now the contact with the child, but also the abducted uh, parent is um, going, undergoing change and, and feels long-term effects.